The Tehran UFO incident is considered one of the most credible UFO encounters, mainly due to the expertise and reliability of the witnesses, the technical details provided in the pilots' reports, and the military's involvement in the incident. It continues to be a significant case in the study of unidentified aerial phenomena. I'm on a journey of discovery. I am seeking answers to some of the most challenging mysteries that face mankind and many nuggets of knowledge that could bring those answers or unsolved cases and tales of the strange and unexplained. This show focuses on recounting cases and stories of unknown phenomena, mysterious events, weird places, and the unexpected. So please make sure to like, subscribe, and comment your thoughts we're about to cover today. I'm going to share my screen here and we're going to get straight into it. So the UFO sighting in Tehran, the capital of Iran, on September 19th, 1976, is one of the most well-documented and widely recognized incidents of its kind. And NICAP, or NICAP, broke the original story in its UFO investigator newsletter in November of 1976. And so here's how it started. So I'm going to share this next image of the control tower. And at about 12.30 a.m. on September 19th of 1976, the people at the tower received four telephone calls from citizens living in the area of Tehran saying that they were seeing very strange objects in the sky. And some reported a kind of bird-like object, while others reported a helicopter with a light on it. However, there were no helicopters airborne at that time. And after he, after the air traffic controller told the citizens that it was only a only stars in the sky he talked to the mahabrad tower and he decided just to go look for himself he's like okay i'm getting all these phone calls but maybe it's not stars in the sky and and i like that kind of critical thinking right there where he didn't fully believe in this sense what he was saying and he says let me look for myself and he noticed an object in the sky similar to a star, but much bigger and brighter. And so after this, he, the air traffic controller, he called um, the uh, Imperial Iranian Air Force, also known as the IIAF, to take a look at this. And this air traffic controller was Hossein Piro Utsi. And He's a he's an experienced air traffic controller. But now what's really interesting about this particular time, this date, this time frame, is that during this whole fiasco, he was conducting a training session when reports of a strange glowing object in the sky began to emerge. But it gets even weirder than that, because not only was he giving a training session, which let me just say this. If you are going through training for anything and something wacky like this happens, that is the highlight of your career, okay? Number one. But number two, and what's odd about this is that the radar was under maintenance during this exact same time. So you have Pierre training people to understand how to do the work at the control tower, but the radar wasn't working during this time frame. So all they could do was use his own eyeballs to attempt and distinguish what that object was in the sky. But luckily he had multiple eyewitnesses during that time. And they all mentioned the ones that he was getting the phone calls, the trainees and himself described a red, yellow and orange object resembling a four blade fan that appeared to split and merge. And that little detail, remember it, we're going to get back to it because it is a very interesting one. So upon observing through binoculars, which is super duper smart, he noted a luminous cylindrical object about 6,000 feet high, rocking like a seesaw with growing glowing blue ends and a red light orbiting its center. And the object, which seemed to morph into a drooping star shape with a green body and a red core, appeared to constantly change form. And so when Pirozzi and his trainees observed this, they were seeing 
various different shapes uh, from their vantage point. And I would like to highlight on this because this is something that we've heard a few times before where people see amorphous type things in the sky, not even fully objects, or are they? Are they just merely balls of light? We're not entirely sure, but this little reoccurring detail has been prevalent in a lot of cases. And there have also been reports of UFO researchers that have looked into this in the aspect of shapes and shapes changing is that sometimes the shape and color changes depending on who's seeing this. And that sounds bizarre, right? It sounds so wacky. But Jacques Vallée is one of the researchers that has looked into that aspect of maybe, just maybe, let's just put on... Let's just think us out of the box here just for a moment. And let's let's say that these objects, whatever they may be in the sky, in some cases, not in all of them, where they are intelligently controlled, but also in a way that resonates with your wavelength, maybe, to where you are going to see orange while the person right next to you seeing the exact same object is seeing it green. And he swears to you, you're not seeing orange, Christina. You're seeing the color green just like myself. And it's not a triangle, Christina. No, it's a cylindrical object. What are you talking about? And so this is something that we've heard of before. And we are seeing it yet again here. And it's something that is talked about, but I wish it was spoken about more frequently. But it gets even weirder. So after the air traffic controller calls the Imperial Iranian Air Force, they jump on that call so quick and they scramble an F-4 Phantom II jet from the nearby air base to investigate. So they took this phone call very seriously. And according to a report that is now on the NSA public database, it says, quote, in IUR volume one, number one, a case in the foreign forum feature described an encounter between Iranian Air Force jets and the UFO, which played cat and mouse with them, appeared on radar and paralyzing their weapons and electronic systems when the jets attempted to fire on it. And we're going to go into more detail on that, but that is really interesting. So one of the pilots by the name of Yadi Nazari saw the object in great detail. And, but at the same time, he was about a hundred kilometers away, but said it was too bright to see a shape. And it was radiating, as he had mentioned, quote, it was radiating, radiating violet, orange, and white light and appeared to be about 36 kilometers or 12,000 feet off the ground. And so Yandi, the pilot again, was instructed to get a visual on this, to do a visual inspection. But when he approached within 46 kilometers or just under 29 miles, the object moved farther away. Shocking, isn't it? So even at Mach 2, which by the way is about 1,500 miles per hour, Yadi was unable to close in. And when he turned back towards Tehran, an object, and this is crazy, an object flew up from behind and darted by, beating him back to the city while he was still 240 kilometers or about 150 miles away. But let's go into more detail on that because that right there isn't giving you the full picture because here was what was going on. There was a main object in the sky. And then there was a smaller object, almost like a missile, coming out from this bigger UFO. And that, <laughs> you know what it kind of sounds like? It sounds like the paper that Avi Loeb and Dr. Sean Kirkpatrick wrote about the dandelion seeds, where they mentioned that a mothership could be pushing out probes in our solar system, attempting to investigate or explore it to the best of its ability. This is sounding very similar. You have a big object and it almost sprouts out a dandelion seed to go ahead and maybe catch up with this pilot to overseed this pilot to make this pilot feel fear because it was going at an immense speed. And Yadi had mentioned that it looked like a missile, like it was aiming straight for him, but he was able to dodge it just right in time. And as he approached this object again, this UFO, UAP, he lost 
all of his radio and navigational aids, but regained them when he turned away. How many times have we heard that detail before, especially with pilots? Time and time again. You can count them on all your fingers and toes, and you'll still have more cases following that. So with this one, he is trying to understand this object. He has been told to shoot at the object, but nothing's working. His radio's not working. His navigational aids isn't working. His missiles aren't working. Nothing. But as he is flying away back to the airport, his radio comes back on, all of his equipment in his plane come back on. And he's kind of scratching his head and he's thinking, how is this even possible? <laughs> so on his last approach, again, he lost his radio and his intercom and all of that fun stuff. And then after he's leaving or going away from this object, he heard the same emergen emergency signal reported earlier before running low on fuel and returning to the airport. But we got to bring in more people onto this case because the next person is Major Jafari and he's a squadron commander. And he later said, quote, startled by a round object which came out of the primary object and started coming straight toward me at a high rate of speed, almost as if it were a missile but as he attempted to fire, suddenly nothing was working. The weapons control panel was out and I lost all of the instruments and the radio. And then when he came back to report to air traffic control, Jafari was instructed to return. So we're hearing this from multiple pilots, very similar instances. But we got to bring in the topic of lights because researchers were also able to find some information on the allowed international lighting configurations and colors and the initial primary object according to the report had altering blue green and red and orange lights and the FAA the federal aviation regulation 43 and then 91.1 .1 on general operations and flight Accessibility states that blue lights are not authorized on U.S. planes. Furthermore, the International Civil Aviation Organization states that blue lights are illegal and that only certain specified light configurations are allowable on aircraft. But this aircraft wasn't seen on radar for the time being they weren't able to get a tracking on it. So in this case, it would be classified as illegal for this whatever object it is to have all of these interesting coloring colored lights, which the pilots described as strobing lights. And they were so violent and moving so quickly, the lights, is that it looked like just one color. And that's something that when you ever look at an airplane of any kind, doesn't even matter, you're going to see the lights go one second at a time red, red, green, green, whatever color, right? And you're able to distinguish the color nicely. You're able to see it come on and off without a problem. But this object, this sighting, it was stroping so quickly, all of these different colors, that it was just confusing the people, confusing the pilots and the witnesses all together. And so that is something that I think fascinates a lot of people with this, but more so it's the pilots and the pilot testimonies that really grabs people at people's attention. Right now we have 579 people watching this like this live. Can we get to 300 likes if and only if you are enjoying the show and a little fun fact for 2024, if you are watching this on a, on a, computer on a laptop, scan this QR code and it'll take you to all of the social media links, the website, the discord and everything in between. But don't worry, I will also share this at the very end of the show as well. But go ahead and put your phone to this QR code and it'll take you to everything you need to see and more. So there is that. Now, at 1.40 a.m., a second F-4 was launched, and the backseater acquired a radar lock 
So you have Jafari in the front, and then you have this backseater whose name we don't really know. And he's saying that they finally got a radar lock on this object. But what is this object? (laughs) And so as the range decreased from 27 nautical miles to 25 nautical miles, the object moved away at a speed that was visible on the radar scope and stayed at 25 nautical miles. Now, the size of the radar return was comparable to that of a 707 tanker, which, by the way, is a little more than half the size of a 747 plane. And so the visual size of the object, however, was difficult to discern because of its intense light. It's intense brilliance. But they were able to kind of get an idea. It must have been about the size of a 747 tanker, 707 tanker. And so as during that same time frame, following the initial encounter, looking at 1.40 a.m., a second Phantom Jet was dispatched, piloted by, of course, Jafari. And they, when they were looking at this, at this, the size of a 707 tanker, they're like, this is This is definitely a UFO. We don't know at all what this is. And for them to admit something like that is huge, but it gets even more insane, especially for people to see it for themselves in the air. Because while they're attempting to understand this object that they're seeing on radar and with their own eyeballs, they're only seeing this incredibly bright light, the object jumps over 27 miles instantly. None of our planes can do that. Not today and not during that time frame. And so this blew Jafari's mind just across the water into another planet, practically. So much so that he gave several interviews, all of which are public, where he mentioned just the incredible, not just interest, but just the shock in what he saw with his own eyes and to go on record almost instantly to share his encounter with the Iranian government and then with the world. And so Jafari described the object as having four strobe lights of different colors and a central red light with a yellow glow and a smaller light detachable from the main object and aggressively approaching the jet caused Jafari to lose all weapon control and communication as he tried to engage it with a missile. Hmm. We've heard this more than once, more than twice, and I can go on and on and on. There have been a handful of pilots that I have attempted to shoot at a UFO and fail. They don't fail because their aim is bad. They don't fail because they don't know how to shoot a missile. They are trained to do that. They fail either due to the speed of the object or they fail because the missile becomes deactivated. It is not able to shoot. There are malfunctions, as they say, with their equipment. But we've heard this almost too many times. And Jafari was no exception to this. He tried to shoot at it as per his commands that were given to him from the ground. And he's like, all right, I'll I'll shoot first and ask questions later. But the missile didn't even leave his plane. So he... His radar operator, air traffic, con- the air traffic controller, and the trainees observed the smaller light land gently on the ground, illuminating the area intensely. So that object that the bigger UFO attempted to shoot at Jafari came close to the ground. And at this moment, he thought, okay, Jafari thought, This object is going to crash to the ground. There's going to be an explosion. Maybe there'll be some casualties if it's near people. That didn't happen. Instead, the object just hovered over the ground, almost as if gravity did not agree with the object to where it didn't work with the object. And this is something that is consistent with a lot of UFO sightings, the ones that simply cannot be explained. Not your helicopters, not your weather balloons, not your airplanes, et cetera, et cetera, not Venus, not swamp gas, whatever. There's a handful of cases that are believed to be genuine UFOs 
whatever that means in the sense of, is it ours? Is it theirs? We don't know. But to where they are able to hover without any movement that none of our planes can do, at least not yet, or at least not to the public's knowledge. Could that actually be the case? Could there be black projects happening right now of where these objects could do such things like reverse engineered projects? Sure. I don't see why not. And in 2023, we got to hear about, at least allegedly, about reverse engineering programs. They would have access to something like this and do something like that, for instance. Could they? Yes, they could. Is it in the realm, is it in the realm of possibility? Yes, absolutely. But we don't have that information public just yet. Now, we will see how that goes with the UAPDA, the Schumer Rounds Amendment, if we will ever get that information. 2024 does seem promising for many when it comes to the, quote, the year of disclosure. But we say that every single year. Now, will this year be an exception? <sighs> I hope so. I really do. That would be a game changer. It would be a life changer. So back to this amazing story. So despite orders to shoot down the UFO, Jafari faced repeated equipment failures. And as he and another commercial flight experienced navigation and communication issues, they spotted another cylindrical object with flashing lights coming out from the big ship. And the UFO as and its associated phenomena persisted until around 4 a.m. So between 12 and 4, this object, this unknown object was in the sky. Now, everyone was seeing this at this point. The trainees, the traffic controller, the Iranian Air Force, people in between. People were looking at this and they're saying, what the heck is going on? And as mentioned by the pilots, the sequence of lights were so fast that all the colors could be seen at once. And the object and the pursuing F-4 continued on a course to the south of Tehran where another brightly lit object, estimated to be one half to one third the apparent size of the moon, came out of the original object. And the second object headed straight toward the F-4 at a very fast rate of speed. And the pilot, and I'm just kind of repeating this, the pilot attempted to fire an AIM-9 missile at the object, but at that instant, his weapons control panel went off and he lost all communications. I know I mentioned to you at least three times now, but that is how significant this aspect of the story is. And so then the F-4 crew, they when they were leaving this bizarre object in the sky, they regained communication and the weapons control panel and watched the object approach the ground, anticipating a large explosion because of gravity. But the object appeared to come rest gently on the earth and cast a very, very bright light over the area of about two to three kilometers so now we got to bring in another person to this case, and that is Lieutenant General Az Azar Barzin, a, and I'm probably saying that like, like the most American accent ever, but he is the Deputy Commander-in-Chief of Operations of the Imperial Iranian Air Force and confirmed in a 1977 interview the strong electromagnetic effect experienced by two F-4s. He says, quote, that is true. Bam. I mean, for someone like this with his credentials to say this case is true is already significant, but it continues. They both were scrambled and they locked on the target, but they received a very strong jamming. And then they lost almost every system they had on the airplane. The jets couldn't fire their missiles because they had very strong jamming. This technology, it UFO, was used for jamming was something we haven't had before and we don't have it now. It doesn't exist because it's a very wide band and could jam different bands, different frequencies at the same time. It's very unusual. So he is saying here, at least to my interpretation, is that first he believes his pilots. What they went through is true. 
Second is that for a piece of technology to jam all of these different aspects, all of these different equipment on the airplane is almost, I'm not saying it's entirely impossible, but it's almost impossible just because that bandwidth, uh, that, that band is just so broad. It's so vague and for it to hit so many different ones, it's almost impossible. You'll need some very, very specific and unique piece of equipment to do all that, to jam all of the systems on an airplane. And this right here is an image of him the Lieutenant General, Deputy Commander in Chief of Operations. That is him right there. And then this is Jafari right here. So let's kind of get into the aftermath. What happened the day after? What was going on? There's all this hubbub. There was all of these people seeing this thing, but there was no evidence on the ground. So after sunrise the following morning, September 20th, the second jet pilot and his operator were taken out in a helicopter to search the lake bed where the object was to believe to have landed. And they found nothing, but several witnesses heard that they described as a high pitched beeper signal concentrated over a farmhouse to the west. Residents there reported that early that morning, they heard a loud noise and saw a bright light. And the very next day, the Tehran Journal wrote a story on the UFO event and a follow up the day after quoted an audio tape of the first jet's communications with the tower control. But that tape was never made public. Dun, dun, dun. And then the Cahan International newspaper published a story that same day citing an unnamed official source, aka Anonymous, who flatly denied that most of the events that night had taken place. Afterwards, however, the Tehran Journal published a summary of Pierozzi's account of events, the air traffic controller, which confirmed the original narrative that something very strange did happen that night. And several papers also claimed that the police were involved, but there is no record of an investigation. <laughs> People get stonewalled with these cases, and the military is no exception. But what I do find very unique about this case is that the pilots were not afraid to tell the world what they encountered quickly afterward. In many cases similar to these, referring to pilots, you will not hear that story for 10, 15, 20 years after the incident. As for these pilots... They told it immediately and for the lieutenant general deputy commander in chief of operations to say it is truth, true in an interview that he gave in 1977. It's it's something that I think people need to consider because this took place 1976. OK, 1976. So he does an interview a little under a year later to say, yep, it's true. And yet people are still questioning that it didn't happen now, now, now. OK, let's let's continue with this thought. People in general don't trust the government. They don't trust the military and their answers. Could this all be a psyop? Could could that lieutenant general say that just to confuse the masses? This is something that people have thought about, but we shouldn't compare the Iranian military and government to the American or the British military and government. Maybe they want to be transparent and you can bet your boots. Maybe they want to be more honest to the public. That's kind of where it's up for you to decide. As with this whole story, do you believe it? Do you not? Let me know in the live chat. Let me know in the comments. I will not tell you one or the other. I will merely provide you the information and then allow you to make up your own mind in what you think. And that's what this channel is all about. It's for you to go on your own research journey to figure out what you want to believe. Because this channel is 
my journey of understanding this topic to the best of my ability. And let's just say these last few years have been intense in, in attempting to understand what is going on. But now this case was making international news, all right, quickly after. Because the day after the encounter, the Iranian Air Force interviewed the two pilots and Lieutenant Colonel Olin Mui of the U.S. Military Assistance and Advisory Group, MAG, sat in for Jafari's testimony. Let's back it up. Why is the U.S. involved? Why do they want to know the information the day after it happened? So Mui prepared a teletype message that summarized the results of this of that interview and sent it to a number of U.S. government offices and intelligence agencies, including the CIA, the NSA, the White House, the Secretary of State, and Henry Kissinger, which, by the way, for those that don't know, and I have to, I have to pull it up because I have it here, Henry Kissinger is an American diplomat, political scientist, geopolitical consultant, and a politician who served as the United States Secretary of State and National Security Advisor in the presidential administration of Richard Nixon and Gerald Ford between 1969 and 1977. Just FYI, okay? Because I know people are going to be like, who's that? myself included. So then Colonel Frank McKenzie of the U.S. Defense Office in Tehran sent a nearly identical message to the Pentagon on September 23rd, just a few days after the incident. And still, Kissinger gave an evasive reply to the request for information from the King of Morocco, citing the 1969 Condon report as justification for disregarding UFOs. And let me just tell you this. The Condon report or the Condon report, however, however you want to pronounce it, it, that whole report was pretty much to shut down Project Blue Book and say, nope, not aliens, UFOs are mundane explanations, and there's that. That's what that report was about. And so then on October 12th, Colonel Roland Evans wrote an evaluation of the Mui memo for the DIA, deeming the information it contained to be of high reliability and value meeting all the criteria necessary to enable a, quote, valid study of the UFO phenomenon. The U.S. Air Force had recently closed Project Blue Book due to the Condon report and claimed to be finished with investigations into UAP. And then in 1978, Captain Henry Shields published a short summary of the case. Why is this significant? That question only you can answer. Why is the U why was the US getting involved with this days after compared to any other country? Why? And it wasn't just like one aspect of the government. It was the CIA, the NSA, the White House, the Secretary of State, multiple generals, multiple colonels, captains. You're getting a lot of hands in this pot. Why? Your guess is as good as mine. I do not have an answer to that. But of course, there is a handful of speculations. Don't you agree? Well, in all of this, see, it gets even cooler because the Iranian government government made a film about the incident starring most of the real life witnesses. The Iranians, they were like, we're not going to cover this up. Heck no, we're going to make a whole dang movie about this. And then many of the same witnesses appeared in an episode of the TV show Sightings in 1994, which featured footage from the film, referring to the Iranian movie, and then also on UFO hunters in the early 2000s as well. But after retiring as a general, Jafari, this man right here that we're seeing on screen, spoke at a conference at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. in 2007, in which a number of high-profile military and government officials demanded a globally coordinated investigation of, U of the UFO phenomenon. And then he also told a story, as I said, to the History Channel's UFO hunters in 2008. This is a case that is truly amazing for people to look into. And yet if you're to casually mention, people will be like, what? 
the 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 Tehran case. I'm not I'm not familiar with it. And then people say, why does everything always happen in the United States, Christina? Why can't you put a case? Tell us a case in somewhere in a different part of the world. Come on, stop being so biased. I haven't gotten that message in that kind of detail, but I know what you're thinking. I can't read minds, but I can guess. And while there are a handful of cases that we have covered that are based in the United States, the world, every single country, none of them are an exception to UFO sightings. Every single country has encountered something. And you can find a lot of those cases actually here on this channel. We've covered countries and states and everything in between on where we talk about other places aside from the United States and their wacky UFO sightings. And so with this one, looking at Iran, it's it's one that needs to be talked about, especially if you're not familiar with it. Hopefully you learned something new about this case or you learned something new in general here on this channel. That's what I want to hear. That's what I want to achieve for 2024. Okay, which I do please hit that like button. Right now we have 742 people watching this live. If you're enjoying that show, hit that like button right down below and comment your thoughts. Now, I got to talk about this. I do. And there's very limited information. There's a helicopter, by the way. Here's uh, Morocco. But I got to talk about this. And, and I'm not going to lie to you. I'm going to be as transparent as possible. I could not find a lot of information about this next thing I'm going to tell you, but maybe you could fill in those gaps. Now, I say to myself, I'm going to put all the information on the table, and then you can make up your own mind on what you believe or not, but I'm not going to be biased and only cherry pick information. I'm going to collect all of it, okay, because that is the way of a researcher. So according to the UFO database, in the early hours of May 13th, 1978, just a little while after this original case that we talked about, at 4 a.m., a 16-year-old a student by the name of E.M. Shed Syed Iyapur captured a photograph of a bluish UFO from his parents' apartment window in Shiraz near Tehran. And this is the, this is the alleged image of what he captured in his parents' apartment. And at that moment, the object remained suspended and unmoving over the city. Now, the photograph was subsequently featured in the May 18th, 1978 edition of the Tehran Magazine and eventually found its way into the archives of the U.S. Defense Intelligence Agency, the DIA. And then in 1980, these files were declassified and more accessible under the Freedom of Information Act. Let me just, let me just say this. I could not find that information about the DIA covering this, about it being released through a FOIA report. I could only find this information on the UFO database. Now, again, if you have more information on that, I would love to know it. If it's a hoax, I'd love to know it. But like I said, I'm not going to cherry pick information. I came across this and I said, it's worthy of sharing and hearing your thoughts on it. But to get an image of a UFO with this kind of detail, it, it kind of it kind of blew my mind. We usually get blobs. We get little dots in the sky and that's it most of the time. But this one was an exception that took place in 1978. Is it real? Is it not? Your guess, seriously, seriously, is as good as mine. And that's... That's our case today. That is our Tales of the Strange and Unexplained. If you enjoyed the show, please consider subscribing as we do three live shows right here on this channel. Cindy, thank you for that. Love these stories, action and adventure. Pew, pew. Thanks, Christina. Thank you for that. And Cassidy, thank you so much as always. I want to say thank you to everyone watching this live and to all of my YouTube members, Patreon supporters, and of course, all of my amazing moderators. Oh, which by the way, there's going to be some really sick updates to my Patreon. Patreon. You want to take a look at that. Those updates will be made rather shortly. And I'm telling you, you're going to get some serious perks to it. And then also, if you enjoy space ambient music, consider taking a look at my space ambient music channel called Cosmic Portals. You can also just scan this QR this QR code right here, and it'll take you there along with all of my other social media links, my website, the Discord server, and everything else that you need. So please make sure to follow me um, across social media as I post pictures, short videos, and 
updates on the things that are happening on this channel as well. So I don't have to say, follow me on Twitter at eyes underscore on the skies or follow me on strange paradigms at no Instagram at strange paradigms. You can just scan this QR code. Okay. And it does it all for you. Okay. Oh, and we're almost, almost at 3000 followers, users on our discord server. Okay. We, we did, we didn't hit that goal. They didn't hit that threshold of hitting 3k by 2024, but you know what? We are so close and I'll take it. I will take it. So if you want to continue the conversation, speak to almost 3000 other like-minded members, share your thoughts, your insights, your experiences, and more right on the Christina discord server. And also it is up there as well. Don't forget that on Thursday will be Mysteries with a History with Jimmy Church of Fade to Black Radio. And then on Friday will be Strange News. All of those shows will be live. So make sure to hit that notification bell right down below so that you're able to tune in live and we're able to have a conversation just like this. That is it for today. I will see you on Thursday. Be safe. And remember, keep your eyes on the skies.